Hey everybody, Doug Walker here. You're probably wondering where the NC is this week. Well, sadly, there is not one because uh, I'm actually on vacation. There will be a new one next week, and it won't be an editorial. It'll be a fledged out, you know, a fully done review. So, um, yeah, no editorial this week. I apologize. But at the same time, I wanted to give you guys something. So, uh, as you probably read in the title, this is uh, uh, my top 10 uh, most attractive female characters in movies, TV shows, whatever. Before I get started with that, uh, just quick plug real fast, there's two cons coming up in July. I've mentioned them before, but just in case you forgot. Uh, there's one in Chicago called Anime Midwest. Here's the website and the information on that. Go check it out. Uh, Brad is gonna be there. Lewis is gonna be there. Team Four Star is gonna be there. Malcolm and Tamara are gonna be there. Jim J. Ross and all these great people. Rob's gonna be there. So, uh, yeah, check that out. It's gonna be a lot of fun. Kineticon is also happening in July. That's, uh, been my favorite con so far. I love it. Uh, so many good people are going to be there. Like, half the friggin' half of your childhood is going to be there pretty much. Uh, before I start, I should make it very clear that this is not actresses that I'm necessarily talking about. It's very much the characters that they play. Um, I don't know these women, <laughs> so, you know, for me to say, oh, well, yeah, they're really hot and really attractive. It's I gotta know something about them. I remember when I did the top 10 anime women's list. I'll get to real soon, I'm sorry. But, um, some people were saying, well, that's great about the character traits and everything, but, but how about just attractiveness, just how they look? And uh, personality is, like, a big part of the attractiveness. And I think I said in my uh, Facebook post, like, if you're judging attractiveness just by how a person looks, that's like, you know telling someone, don't, don't show me the Super Bowl, just tell me what the score is. That majority of the fun, you know, is in the personality, is in the person, you know, and not just how they look. So, but, yes, I, I like how, you know, I'm gonna certainly sense if someone looks really good, that's gonna play a factor, but it's, it's not the whole thing, at least it's definitely not for me. And uh, I just think this is fun. I think it's a fun thing to do. It's sort of fun to compare and contrast, and people also talk about the people they find attractive, so blah, blah, blah. I've gone on enough. Let's go ahead and get to the top 11 attractive female characters. Did I say top 11 or top 10? Uh, top 10. It's top 10. Karen Allen from Raiders of the Lost Ark. Somebody was asking me once, how can you find Karen Allen in that movie so attractive? Because Indiana Jones constantly has to save her. And, you know, and people know I'm very anti-damsel in distress if, it, if it's not required or doesn't seem fitting. Um, and in this movie, I really think this is a big testament to her performance because they're right. She has to be saved like a dozen times in this movie, but she is still so badass and still so contributing to everything and always helping out Indy and she's a tough drinker and she's always finding ways to get out and she's spunky and she's funny and she's fightful and she's just friggin awesome she's like you know she's the action gal and she's just I, I can't explain it I just know a lot of it is in the performance and nobody would just look at her in this movie uh, despite whether or not you see her what she does. If you just look at her, like, you, you see a still of her, nobody would be like, oh yeah, that's the chick that Indiana Jones has to save all the time. It's like, no, you definitely get that from uh, Willie <laughs> from Temple of Doom. That's the annoying pain in the ass that just always screams and goes, oh, but tries to look pretty. It's, no, bullshit. Karen Allen is awesome. I even thought she was awesome in C Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. It's like, I wish she did more, don't get me wrong, but it's like, seeing her back, I'm like, no, cool. That's really cool. She's spunky, she's awesome, she gets in the action, she's a badass, uh, even though in the movie she has to be saved a lot. So uh, I think a lot of it is her performance, and uh, yeah, Marion's awesome. Marion, it's Marion. I've been fucking up a lot in this so far. Chris and Dunn's in Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. Um, yeah, I know a lot of you are gonna be like, Really? All that shit you gave Mary Jane Watson, the Spider-Man movies and stuff? Yeah, I still hate Mary Jane. It, it, she's a horribly written character. Uh, I, I seem to be finding out more and more that Chris and Dunst didn't care for the character either. From, from what I've heard, it's, it's the internet. It's, who knows? I don't know her, so I have no idea. But um, 
Kristen Dunst is one of those actresses where it, every time I see her, it's like you always see she's she's doing her best with a role, and you know it's. I think it usually works. I think she actually is uh, very charming and good at what she does, even in something like Spider-Man, you know. Like I said, I, I think in Spider-Man 3 is where you start to see, oh, like, she like she really can act, you know. it's That sounds bad, because it's like the roles before, she's just given nothing, and she's doing her best with it. But in 3, it's like, no, I think she's holding this okay. Like, she's actually showing, you know, the tough side of, you know, being with a superhero when she needs the attention, even though she's given him a ton of attention. Um... So, but with that aside, we're talking about Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. Uh, that one just felt a bit more realistic. She felt much more like a real character, and I, I just remember her playing all sorts of different angles in this. I remember her being, you know, really angry when she's trying to stop Jim Carrey from coming in. I remember her being very playful when she's just going and hanging out with her friends. I remember her being very hopeful and very sad when, I won't give away too much, but there's somebody that she likes in the film that she tries a hit on and stuff, and I remember how torn apart she is when she figures out something at the end. She really runs the gamut in this, and I think she she does it really well, and it just seemed like a very fully uh, flushed out character, even though it's kind of just one of the side characters. Uh, you know, it, it's not Jim Carrey, it's not, uh, 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 what's her name, Kate Winslet, or, you know, it, it, even Elijah Wood, I think, has more screen time than she does, but I, I think she did it really well. Um, and, uh, I don't know, she, the more you find out about her in the film and what she kind of went through and what she put herself through, it's, it's, it, she becomes really interesting. There's something about her eyes. She has these very sharp eyes. Like I said, particularly when she looks angry, when she's stopping Jim Carrey from coming in, I mean, they can just become, like, these death eyes, like, just this sharp lasers going through you, but then they can also be, like, you know, so kind and comforting in other scenes, and, yeah, I, I think she's really good. I, I think she's a, actually a very talented actress. And I know, like I said, I hate Mary Jane. I think it's a terrible character. But um, I think she does very well in other roles. Um, I think she's good at taking these roles that are kind of nothing and turning them into something. Or, or as best as a Sam Raimi Spider-Man movie can. <laughs> Chris and Dunn's, I'm always like, yeah, there's like she's really good. Well, what's the movie where I always think of that she actually comes through and just runs the full gamut? And, and that's sort of the one. I'm sure there's others, um, but that one in particular, I felt like she was kind of, uh, you just saw every sort of side of her. Even as a side character, you just saw her do all these different emotions and these different parts, and she plays them all great. Like I said, it's weird that it's a side character, but uh, I thought she played so well, it was definitely worth mentioning. So, definitely good stuff. <laughs> Jane Levis, if I'm saying that correctly, I'm not entirely sure. This is Daphne Moon from Frasier. Um, a lot of it's the accent. I think a British accent is just, it's, it's beautiful, it's elegant, it's, it's just great. Um, and, uh, again, there is sort of this, I don't want to say naivete, but there is just sort of this blind innocence to this character and how everything just sort of excites her and she's happy about everything and she tries to always be in the best mood. No, there is a naivete, because, yeah, Niles is always trying to get with her and she never catches on. And, I don't know, I think in a lot of ways, I'm very naive to a lot of stuff and I know I am, and... But there... what's that phrase? Ignorance is bliss? Uh, there's some truth to that. Um, it can also cause a lot of trouble, and if you can avoid being ignorant, it's like, please do. <laughs> you know, I, I at least try. Um, but there is something where it's, I don't know, when you're not aware of so much, so much danger and so many, so much judgment and stuff, you're, you're just kind of naturally happy. You're not thinking about all these things that can sort of come after you or, or things that might hurt you. You're, you're just sort of going through life, you know, enjoying it. And that's sort of what I get out of her. She's just sort of very, you know, she's happy with her job. She's happy where she lives. She's happy with the people that she works for. Um, and she's not, she, she's not like an airhead at all. You know, she's very much, you know, just, she's very blissful and she's very happy and she's very simple. And I really admire simple people. Um, I think there's always this thing about, like, you know, if a person seems, you know, very simple, it's like, oh, well, then they can't be good. There's nothing a simple person can offer us. I just think that's such bullshit. You know, simple people, you know, keep their lives very simple and not too complicated because they know if things get 
too complicated, it, they get out of control. And when things are out of control, they create stress. And when you create stress, you're not happy. So that really makes sense. I just like that, you know, this woman, she's, she's found a good job. She's found, uh, you know, good people to be with. And she just kind of enjoys herself. It, it, it's that optimism. It's the constant, kind of naive, but also trying her best optimism that, I don't know, I, I really respect. <laughs>
I'm sure I butcher that name, but something I can't butcher is how awesome she is in this show. It is sort of the standard cop showing the person out of touch and out of time around. It's the, I always say it's kind of like April O'Neil with a gun, <laughs> you know, uh, just showing the turtles around, like how the world works and stuff. But she's, um, what I like about her is that even though it is sort of the very standard safe, characters showing people around with a tragic backstory that of course the person she's showing around will understand and will romance bloom of course it will um but what i like about her is that she even though she is beautiful i'm just a beautiful woman um you never don't buy that she's a cop like you believe it there's definitely this this determination and this focus even the tragic backstory that she's given uh, uh with her sister and nobody believing her you still buy it you, you the way she plays it off you totally by that they went through this and she sort of had to renounce her sister and she's living with this guilt of doing that and it's all there it, nothing about her ever seems like you know just too happy or too perky or hey i'm just here to kind of be the eye candy thing like she she really carries this role that is honestly a very standard role but it's the performance it's what she brings to it and she really brings a lot and i think she does it very very well um i think she's she's great at being you know sort of the solid to ichabod in the show it's this is a really stupid show by the way I'm, everybody knows this that i think a lot of people have been saying like this is sort of like the new buffy in a sense. I mean, maybe not quite. Uh, like, Buffy definitely had, like, a real cult following, and, and the stories got really complicated and, and detailed and stuff. Um, I think this is a little bit more gimmicky than that. Um, but, yeah, I think there's still... It, it wouldn't work if you just got somebody who was only there to be attractive and only there you know, just to get, you know, horny boys to watch or something. There's a James Bond movie with, uh, with Denise Richards as a rocket scientist or something like that. We get it. It's James Bond. All the women are super attractive and hot spies and stuff. But, uh, you know, nobody was buying this. And, you know, she couldn't carry it at all. And I don't think it's just the appearance. I really don't. I think that there is still this weight that you can bring to something where it sounds like you know what you're talking about. And she didn't. And to her credit, a lot of people saying this science mumbo jumbo and stuff, you know, can't really bring that. There's actually the next movie I'm reviewing. Uh, you'll see there's another character I'm talking about that cannot do the sci-fi mumbo jumbo. Um... So, I don't think it's just, oh, hey, that person's too attractive, so they can't be smart. I don't think that's it. I think there still has to be this believability, and this woman gets it. I think she really does bring it, and you see the guilt in her uh, when she has to think about her past and, and confront it, uh, or when she confronts her sister. Going back and forth between how much of this Ichabod guy do I believe, you know, and how much is just a crazy man. Uh... And I think she does a good job. I think it's really solid. For a role that is so safe and, and kind of predictable, I think she really brings a lot to it, and uh, I think she does good. Mila Jovovich in The Fifth Element. We all know Multipass, and we all remember the outfit that she war in this. I swear that doesn't play that big a part. There's just something so cute about somebody trying to figure out how things work that you obviously know. You know, I, I love Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. I love when all the historical figures are trying, they're in the mall and they're just trying to figure out how the world operates. I love that stuff. I just think that stuff is a lot of fun and it's really cute. And when you have, um, you know, this woman come in who's sort of like an animal that's constantly under guard and just doesn't know what's going on. I love it when they put her in the shower and it's going up and she's just looking around and it's very animalistic. Uh, it's just really fun to watch, especially when you know a lot of the stuff is not harmful. Um, and when she finally learns the language and can kind of talk and it's... I don't know. I definitely went through a phase, too, where I really liked women with, like, different colored dyed hair, like the really weird colors, you know, of course that orange color and the supreme being has orange dreads, I mean like bright orange dreads, it's like, okay. There was this innocence to her, like I said, just trying to figure out the world, but there was definitely 
you know, there was the badass qualities in there, too. You know, she would constantly, you know, get in fights and, you know, whatever, and jump through stuff, and constantly jumping off of stuff, off of cliffs and stuff. Um, and she was obviously super strong because she would crash through cars and walls and so forth. Um, and there's... It was sort of just a fun mix of both kind of badass, but kind of innocent and sweet. And it, I don't know, there's just something... It, maybe there is sort of like that protective nourishment or whatever in, in men or in me anyway that's just like, you know, oh, it's okay, here's how this works and here's how... But then she can also go kick ass and be like, oh, yeah, rock on! So, I don't know, it's a fun mix. It's, um... The only time she gets a little annoying is at the end when she's like, you know, Oh, war bad! I don't want to save humanity because they have wars! Beginning of the movie, the big turtle people come in and they're like, War is coming, we must stop it! It's like, you know what war is! So, um, you hit it on Earth to protect it from war. So, whatever shit's going on with us, you guys have had it much worse. <laughs> so... Yeah, that was weird and pretty stupid, but the movie is stupid, but I love it. It's a great, fun, dumb movie. Um, so, yeah, I can't think of too much else to say about it. Um, just a fun character, and I thought she did a great job in it. <laughs> Natalie Wood in The Great Race. Oh my god, she... Okay, so not only is the character awesome, I mean, this is like... When was this made? Like, in the 60s or something like that? And it's about, I want to say, the 30s and... Yeah, I want to say, like, the 20s and 30s. You got the 60s and the, the 20s, and this character is, like, a super strong feminist. Like, she's fighting for the vote, and she's trying to be emancipated, and she's trying to, you know, go out there and say, you know, come on, women, you know, out of the kitchens, into the workplace, and so on. But she's not annoying. I think there is something about any cause, I mean, any cause at all, when you constantly get the wagging finger. I think there's something about, you know, well, we're not there yet, and this is wrong, and this is wrong, and this is wrong, and, and there's only so much bawling out somebody can hear, uh, when really what you want is that you do want acknowledgement of the problems, but you also want a celebration about what's good about your cause. And that's why I love Natalie Wood in this. She's so smart, but she's also so charming, and she's so optimistic, and she really believes it, and she's constantly smiling, and she's loving what she's doing. She's so enjoying fighting for this cause because she knows who she is, she knows what she's fighting for, and she knows it's a good thing, and she has this thought that they're going to win. It's like, yes, it it'll take a while, but we're on our way, it's gonna happen, because she is so certain about her cause, and she's so certain about herself. There's that great confidence in that character. With her, there's just this great celebration of who she is and what she's fighting for. They always give her these really fun, outlandish outfits. I, I remember there's one where they're like, they're in the cold, and she's wearing sort of this Eskimo outfit, and yet somehow this curl still comes out <laughs> of the side. Uh, and it's always there. It's always like, you know, it's not something that naturally sort of happens. Somebody had to gel it up or something, and it's really funny. Um, and, yeah, it, it's sort of this, she's sort of this really big, great celebration of femininity. And, and Natalie Wood is wonderful. This so easily could have been just an annoying performance. It could have been someone who did nothing but, you know, complain and wave the finger. But she just has this lust for life and what she's doing that it's just, it's irresistible. Natalie Wood in that movie, uh, just... Man, she's great. <laughs> Michelle Pfeiffer from Batman Returns. This is a totally different Catwoman from the comics, the cartoons, the TV shows, any other Catwoman that's ever been done before. Uh, so I know it's not following, like, the original vision. But with that said, this version, I think is awesome. I love just how friggin' crazy she is, but I also love how driven she is. I think it's the contrast of who she was uh, against who she's become and what she's trying to be. You know, it, she doesn't even know what she's trying to be. She's just falls out of a building and she just wakes up and it, how do you accept that? How do you treat that? How do you know? And it just obviously just totally went to her head and she went insane, but it's that struggle between sanity and insanity. And, you know, sort of good and evil and, and where you lie and... But at the same time not being taken advantage of it. Oh, it's just a, a great character. Uh, Shell Pfeiffer plays it great. Um, that outfit. <laughs> good God. 
is pretty damn attractive. I, I like it because you can look at it, you don't necessarily say like, you know, oh, that's goth you know, or, or whatever, that's just like, you know, it, there's definitely like a fetish thing in there, but I don't know, the, the little uh, crosshatches, the, the little stitches, across, those are so strange and so weird and kind of creepy and kind of offsetting, like a Frankenstein monster that was put back together, and that's kind of what she is, somebody who died and is brought back, so I, I love that, I mean, I, I just thought that was, you know, so unique. Uh, and, and just very piercing to the eye when you just see those white stitches uh, stand out. Um, with Fiverr herself, uh, the, the look, it's still very feminine because, you know, they give her that really thick eyeshadow and the, the uh, lipstick, all that stuff. But she's also kind of falling apart through the movie, too, and the outfit's getting ripped up more, and, you know, her hair's going crazy, and she's just kind of turning in more and more into this beast. I don't know, in terms of why that's attractive, um, when she first comes out and, and she does the voice, the very seductive voice, like she's got stuff figured out and she's in control, she's just gonna do whatever the hell she wants. She knows what she does not want to be anymore, which is, you know, her old self, you know, the, the uh, secretary taking orders and stuff. And I think when she comes out, she knows no more. I don't know what I want to be or what exactly I want to do or become, but I know it's not this, that is gone, you know, now I'm just gonna experiment and not give a shit what anybody thinks. I'm just gonna do what I want. Um, and, and that, that's great fun. Again, I think it is a little bit of that confidence, that confidence on taking a chance, you know, just totally giving up on what anybody thinks. A Fiverr herself, even when she's not, like, in the catsuit outfit, uh, she just looks beautiful in this movie. The, the scene where she's dancing with Bruce Wayne and stuff, I mean, she just looks beautiful there. Um, and she plays it so well. I mean, she is just... That same scene, I, I think that's her at her best when she's dancing with uh, Michael Keaton there. And, you know, there's a point where he's like, you know, who the hell do you think you are? And she starts to break down, and it's like she's looking at him as a cry for help, and she says, I don't know anymore, Bruce. And then, like, as soon as, like, the camera pans over and you see the back of... Uh, Keaton's head, and then it comes around, she's laughing like she was just never crying or never looking sad at all, and she's just like, you know, really giggling, really laughing. It's just so nuts, but God, she does it so well, and I don't know. It, it's just, I'd be fascinated to know how that mind ticks, and, uh, but again, there's, there's sort of that lost element that, you know, if maybe somebody can help her, maybe Batman can help her find the way, because he's clearly kind of nuts too. He dresses up like a bat and everything, so he thinks that he can help her, but she might be too far gone. But is she, is she not? And so I I love it. I It's a fascinating character. I love the take on it, and uh, it, I just think it's awesome. <laughs> Amelia Clark from Game of Thrones. Yes, Daenerys. She... No! Oh! <laughs> I fucking love Daenerys. She is so awesome. Um, she just t t takes everything, you know, for her own. And she, and she does it smart and she listens to people, but she... You know, she's also kind of learning, and when she learns something, it's like, you know, she she sticks by it, and she... I... Ah, it's Daenerys! The mother of dragons, man! I, I love how far she's come. I love what she started out as and what she has done with it. I love, 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 love characters that can take something that was a disadvantage and just turn it into this unbelievable strength, and that's something Game of Thrones does so well! Um, you know, I, I love Daenerys, I love, uh, I love Tyrion, and I love Arya, because they've all done that. And that is just such strength, and it's just such something to respect, and I, I really love this character for that. Um, I, I like a lot of people, I'm waiting for it to get going, and I'm like, okay, come on, let's, um... You know, when are we really gonna start taking over the world here? You know, just very, very slowly, but I still love her. I love watching her. I love watching her learn. I love watching her definitely be in control, be, be in power, but there is definitely this sympathy, uh, you know, when true wrong is being done. Uh, I love it when she takes all the people that they hung up, which was like, you know, I, I want to say it was their kids, I think, uh, going to this village is to scare people off, and she takes every single one of them down, you know, when going there, when taking over this village. And But at the same time, you know it's like, it's just fueling the anger that's building up inside of her and how she's going to, like, teach this town a lesson 
Um, and it's great. She, you know, she's a, she's obviously a badass, and you see her become a badass. I, I love how you take this situation where she's just with this brute, you know, the, the, this brute king. I mean, just this, you know, quote unquote savage, and she. She knows she can't defeat him. I mean, this guy's like just a fucking monster. So she tries to sort of psychologically, you know, win him over like, hey, I'm not just a prize. Let's actually sort of work things out here. And she does it in the way the guy can understand. And she sort of starts to take control. And sort of shows like, you know, this see, this isn't so bad. We can work with it. And you just so brilliantly, you see her win him over, but then genuinely fall in love with him uh and it's this really <laughs> it's the stranger thing it's like how the hell do you have a, a romance like an actual kind of believable romance start with rape <laughs> i mean that is how this starts you see her do it and you see step by step how she does it and i love characters that can just start at the bottom and can slowly but surely build their way up i mean this is a problem when like someone you know, is a nobody and starts off as nothing, is suddenly given all this power, suddenly given all this attention, you know, I mean, this is why you see so many child stars go, you know, is that that's not how it should be done. It's not quite earned. Uh, and it's not given the time to let the actions that you're doing sink in and to have you learn what works and what doesn't. Uh, and that's why I love stories like this, where you see them just start at such a horrible place to start and slowly get stronger and stronger and smarter and smarter and learn and learn and make mistakes. I mean, there are definitely mistakes made. And she just turns into something awesome and so powerful, but also, you know, she's she's trying to fight for the right things. I mean, you see how awful this world can be. I mean, and just the tyrants that rule it. And she's, granted, very badass and having her dragons blow people up and, you know, get her armies together and... But there is still sort of this, she, she still wants to rule fairly, and she tells the people she's going to lead, I'm going to treat you with dignity and respect, so it's like, I, I really want to see this woman win. I want to see her win. She's just awesome. Fucking Daenerys. Daenerys rocks. That's all. <laughs> Catherine Zeta-Jones from The Mask of Zorro. Yeah, I know. Big shock. <laughs> I bet nobody saw this coming. Um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry I'm so predictable. Um, a lot of people were wondering uh, when I was talking about the list, because everyone I told I was going to do this list, it's like, well, we know what's going to be number one. You know, but is it going to be Chicago or is it going to be Zorro? It's Zorro because that was the very first time I saw her, and it is a fun character. It, it's a character who... Um, you know, was brought up in riches and being raised by the bad guy, but at the same time, you know, can sword fight, can still sort of hold her own. Actually, it's something I really like is there is a line in the movie where, you know, Antonio Banderas is trained by the original Zorro. Uh, and then he goes and he fights Catherine Zia-Jones. She is, she's been having the proper training since she was four, she said. And so you would think it's like, well, how's this guy who's been trained, I don't know, a couple months, something, really intensely, but still trained a couple months, how can he defeat someone who's been trained since she was friggin' four, and he doesn't really? That's what I like about it, she actually defeats him. But then when it gets to working without the swords, like, you know, he has to use the objects around him and stuff, that is where she's defeated, and that makes sense. A person learning fencing wouldn't be taught, you know, well, now you have to learn when you're going out being a vigilante to use other surroundings around you, that probably wouldn't be taught in fencing, or maybe it is, I don't know, but it's certainly taught much more to Zoro because he has to do it to, you know, to survive, you know, and do what he does, you know, she doesn't. So I really like that, I really respect that. Um, but that's not the only thing. Uh, the, and I know a lot of this is movie magic, um, because there is something about the way they did her makeup in this movie. She has never looked as good as she has in this movie. And it, Catherine Zia Jones is beautiful. I mean, she is just like, God damn, you are fucking beautiful. You're unbelievable. By God. Um, it, it, even now, it's like, I know she's getting up there, but she still looks really good. Um, and she's a decent actress, too. I, I think she, you know, Chicago, she did all the singing and dancing, and, and I totally bought it and believed it. Um, but the, uh, yeah, I think the, the the makeup job they did in this, there's a deleted scene 
in the Zorro DVD, and if you watch it, you see how it looks before the filters are put on. And you know the makeup plays a big part, because before the filters are put on, and then the smoothing it out and whatever, she looks really weird. Not her natural face, I'm talking about the makeup looks really, really odd. Uh, especially around the nose, there's this really weird thing they're doing. I, I don't know what it is, I'm not a makeup person, but it's definitely an effect. That's why, that's another reason why I said very much this is movie characters, you know, it's not the actresses themselves. I mean, they, they bring a lot, of course, uh, probably the majority, but it's still the characters, because I know it's a movie, I know it's an illusion, and I know the characters aren't real, and I'm attracted to the illusion of these people. Cary Grant, uh, Peter Bonavich tells a story about how Cary Grant tried to get him in a party, you know, kind of crashing it, and the woman's like, name? And he says, Cary Grant. And she looks at him and says, you don't look like Cary Grant. And he says, I know, nobody does, not even me. And it's very true, you know, it's not even John Wayne can be John Wayne. It's like the image is just so, the illusion is so built up. So I get that. That's one of the reasons I very much want to make this, you know, the characters, not the actual people, because I never met these people. Um, but yeah, there is just this, <sighs> that Zorro movie as well came at a time, I've talked about this before, where there was just, I want to say it was like Batman and Robin up to... Probably Zorro. Maybe, honestly, maybe a year after Zorro. Because uh, Zorro was like the one movie. Because there was a solid three or four years where we just never got a good summer movie. Summer movies were expected to suck. And we just accepted it. And it was awful. As This really was like... And I'm, movies go through lulls and hills and valleys. I get it in production companies and stuff. But this was like really the dark times of summer movies. You know, and other, whatever, around Christmas and stuff, maybe some good movies would come out, but summer movies were just dead. I mean, they were fucking dead. And anyone that says, oh, summer movies are so bad nowadays, and no, they, from Batman Return, uh, Batman and Robin, to whatever, uh, I'm trying to think where the really big turning point happened. Um, uh, from Batman and Robin up until about three or four years after that, we had nothing but shit. And it was just expected we were going to go see our summer movies. They were going to suck. Nothing we can do. Um, maybe the internet's changed then. I don't know. But it was the Discoverer CG and it really sucked. And Zorro came out like the same year as Armageddon, Deep Impact, Perfect Storm, all that fucking shit. They were all terrible. And Zorro came out and it was sword fighting. And it was stunts. And it was characters. And it was good story. And it was... You know, new people. You know, we never really saw Catherine Zeta Jones before. We saw a little bit of Antonio Banderas, but he was up and coming. And uh, the, the villains nobody saw before. And it was like the most refreshing movie. It was saying, yes, summer movies can be good again. And it was just, yes, like that, that was the big point. So, yeah. So, and when she, and she was just like that blooming, like that blossoming, that, hey, summer movies can be good again and there can be new people you haven't seen before that can just win you over and they can be talented and they can be fun and they can be energized and they can be charming and, and they can be romantic and the romance in the film is very believable uh and i like how she's kind of playing zorro you know but she's also trying to stand by her father who is kind of the bad guy too and the uh that chemistry in that movie between uh, zorro and her it's just like you know oh my god and the sword fight it's just it's just hot it's hot. <laughs> There's nothing else I can say about it. Um, so, yeah, I I still think Catherine Zeta-Jones is, is beautiful, and I, I think she's talented, uh, but in terms of what's the movie that was just like, just blew me away in terms of just a attractiveness and, and energized and, uh, and interesting, and out, that's the one, man. That's just like... Man, everybody was blown away too. Everyone when that movie came out was just like, who is this woman? Who We gotta figure out who this woman is, because this is like... She was so beautiful, it was like a punch in the face. I mean, it was like, where the hell did this woman come from? So, yeah, that's... I'm sorry. I, I, no, I'm not sorry. This is why you watched the video. You wanted to see me gush. Uh, so, yeah, it's... um. 
it's Catherine Zia Jones, man. It's uh, and that's the movie. You know, that's the movie where the illusion and the uh, the likability of the character and the movie and the scenario and the action and the visuals and everything just came together. And I really think she was one of the main centers of of that explosion of the illusion. That, that's, it's a very attractive movie. The movie, as far as action films go, it's one of the most attractive action movies because everything is in it. There, there's dancing, there's sword fighting, there's drama, there's comedy, there's beautiful people, there's ugly people, <laughs> there's, you know, there, there's uh, this grittiness to it. it. It's not for kids, it's not entirely for adults either, it's kind of for everyone, but it's, it's, it, it's turning into just this big, praising of the movie, but really I'm talking more about the praise of the illusion. And that's really what this list, I felt, was. It's the praising of the illusion of what what we want to be and what we're looking for. Um, and, yeah, I don't see any shame in that. I see no shame in talking about what draws you to a person, what are good traits, what are good qualities, um, what do you like visually, what do you like inside. Um, I see no fault in talking about it. So, Guys, that's my list. Um, who are some of the characters that you find attractive? Whether it be TV shows or, or movies, whatever. Uh, and how much of it do you think is the actress? And how much of it do you think is the actual writing itself? Um, or directing or whatever. Uh, so leave in the comments below. Talk about it. Because um, I think it's a fun thing to talk about. Even if you're a woman, talk about the guys you find attractive. You know, if you think it's the actor or the, uh, or the writing, directing, all that stuff. You know, explore. Talk about it. Um... Yeah, guys, that's about it. Next week, there'll be a new NC review, and it'll be a full review. won't be an editorial, and uh, I will see you guys then. Take care. I forgot to mention, if you're gay or bi also, go ahead and leave that below too. <laughs> you know, I didn't mention that in there, but you know what? I should. I definitely should. So, um, yeah, I, attraction is fun. Go ahead, leave your thoughts, talk about it, and uh, what it is that attracts you to those people. So, that's about it, and take care.